Thank you for joining us today. The session is Data, Speed and Costs, What Matters to Canadian Businesses. Uh, this, we will be discussing a study that CBA had commissioned looking at corporate payment and government payment needs uh, globally and in Canada. We've assembled a panel here uh, comprising of those who were involved. Uh, we have a government representative, a corporate representative, and uh, representatives from Payments Canada and Deloitte who were heavily involved and instrumental in delivering the research. My name is Andrew Ross. I am the Director of Payments at the Canadian Bankers Association. Uh, the CBA represents more than 60 member institutions and we advocate for public policy uh, for, that uh, supports a thriving banking sector uh, so that Canadians can meet their financial needs. We also support financial literacy and uh, financial crime and we work with law enforcement to fight financial crime. I'll pass it along and let the other panelists uh, self-introduce. I'm Aaron Conlon. Uh, I'm from Rogers Communications. I uh, manage the um, su subscriber payments coming into our company for all of our consumer and, and business customers, uh, including uh, all of our retail stores and uh, media divisions. Uh, so, Alex Gontranko, uh, I work for the Government of Ontario in the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, Ontario Shared Services. I work with all the ministries uh, across the government, the Ontario Financing Authority, to provide uh, enterprise financial uh, solutions, including payments. Uh, I just wanted to tell a quick story as, as by way of introduction. So, you've been hearing a lot about millennials and the client focus. So I've got two very expensive millennials that are <laughs> both in grad school. And uh, I, I had dinner with my daughter, Natasha, last night. And, uh, you know, Natasha, I'm doing this, uh, you, know, you know, panel tomorrow on payments. Can you give me your payment experience? So she goes, Dad, that, that's really is easy because I had two recent uh, experiences. So she uh, did her taxes, Canada Revenue Agency, and, and it was a great experience. Uh, and I asked why. Well, I got a refund, Dad. <laughs> and, it, and it went quickly into my bank account so I could pay my tuition. So that was one experience. The other experience was, um, you, know, she, you know, both kids are heavy users of Uber and Amazon, right? And uh, so the next experience was uh, getting a student loan. So uh, again, a great experience, a, a government experience. And uh, she goes, it was quick and easy. I applied for it the second time. They had all my experience. So my kids are really about less friction, uh, making payments easy. And, and that's the topic uh, uh, you know, of the whole session. So just wanted to give you that uh, perspective in terms of the government perspective and my kids' perspective. <laughs> I'm Ryan Grundy. I'm with the Industry Relations team at Payments Canada. Uh, my mandate is to provide dedicated focus to the stakeholder ecosystem. And for those of you who may not know, we classify stakeholders at Payments Canada as all players within the Canadian payments ecosystem who are not financial institutions. And so we effectively do this through a, a myriad of methods and touch points. But ultimately, our goal is to raise awareness within the Canadian payments ecosystem to foster advocacy by amplifying the voice of the stakeholder and ultimately to drive adoption when we do deliver the, the platforms for modernization. Uh, Vivek Ramasubramanian, I'm a senior manager in Deloitte's payments practice. Um, my focus is uh, in helping many of the players in the ecosystem, governments, banks, regulators, um, also the emerging fintechs with all of their payment strategy, roadmap, and those kinds of things. Uh, more recently, we've been involved heavily on this work with the CBA Payments Canada and the corporates in kind of looking across the board uh, uh, and trying to understand what their needs are. We're going to dive deep into those uh, pieces, but that was kind of the focus over the last little bit. So perfect segue into why we're here. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the CBA, on behalf of our members, commissioned a study uh, by Deloitte to look at, to get, to get a deeper understanding at uh, the corporate payment needs and government payment needs as we move through modernization. Uh, it, was a, it was a work that we did in collaboration actually uh, quite closely with Payments Canada. Uh, so it was a, definitely an independent study and uh, we started out, or they started out I should say, uh, Deloitte did a global scan looking at what other key markets uh, were doing and some of the needs and some of the, some of the uh, solutions that they were bringing into market to address some of the needs that they, that they had. 
Um, we wanted to go deeper on a, from a Canadian perspective, so we actually set up interviews across nine provinces uh, and ten different market segments, looking at government and corporate, and when I say corporate, small, medium, and large uh, businesses, and trying to get a better understanding of the needs and what will drive uh, value for them. Uh, the re output was uh, a report, and obviously the intent is to drive, really help to drive Payments Canada and the industry to deliver on the uh, setting up the proper priorities and the and proper delivery of items that would be valuable to the ecosystem. So we'll jump right in. Um, the first, I think, first topic that came up at virtually every interview was data. Not surprising, I think we've seen it for the last two and a half days already. Data seems to be integral. Um, so in terms of data, and I'll start with you, Aaron. I was just at the last session, you talked about, uh, you know, you have a lot of data, you right. get a lot of data. What is, a, what is it about data or enriched data that excites you as we, as we talk about payments modernization? Um, the the, th the exciting thing is that in the future, I can see it actually being useful. Um, right now, we get a ton of data, but a lot of it, it's not uh, formatted in a, in a standard format where we can use and expect certain information in certain fields. We get our files from our, our, our banks, and they have a lot of scattered data because it's no, there's no fixed fields on what's required into each field. Um, if we had a standardization of that, we could use that to totally streamline our electronic payments um, that we receive um, versus building an in-house solution. Uh, we've built an in-house solution to try and match probably about 50 to 60 percent, um, and the remainder still has to go back to manual matching. We get an email, we get a deposit, we've got to match those two up. Two up. Um, so outside of our in-house solutions, um, to work with the fact that we don't have the correct data, um, that would just streamline and make our process so much easier um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Rogers, I mean, you're a large organization. You have, uh, you're both a supplier and a buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, w can you differentiate data and uh, th that sort of collection of that data across the two different sides of payments? Yeah, so like EFTs are great. You make a payment, you need to make a EFT payment. It's easy, it's quick, it's electronic. Everything's great. It's on the receiving end of that, um, where you, that data doesn't come in a format that is that everybody is using. Um, so there might be ten different fields in there, and each company that's sending us a payment is going to use those ten f different fields differently. So from a payment standpoint and making payments through AP, it's amazing. We like it. It's fast. It's quick. It's easy. Receiving them, on the other hand, it's challenging trying to match up the payments with the the data that we need to. To. So do you see ISO as a silver bullet? Oh, it's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, like it, it's, I look at the processes now and the challenges that we have now, and it's, yeah, it's, it's going to solve so many of our problems that we have with data. And right, like we've got our in-house solutions that's matching 50 to 60 percent. If we get a, if we get enriched data, then we're going to be at 100 percent or near 100 percent, and it's going to come with the file. So, really looking forward to that, that time. And uh, Alex, from a government perspective, again, I know you would have uh, all sorts of payments, maybe for the audience. I don't know if you'd, maybe you can give a little bit of background of what sort of payments uh, the Ontario government deals with, both as a supplier and buyer, and uh, talk about some of the pain points that you see and why data will help you. Right. So in terms of the government, there's outgoing payments to, to citizens. It could be for benefits that the government provides. Uh, it could be to vendors or suppliers. Um, so those are the types of payments, uh, outgoing payments. And the government has over 200 programs that it provides payments for. Um, and that's outgoing payments. So w we seem to be doing better on the outgoing payment side from a data perspective. But where we really have challenges are incoming payments. So there are incoming payments. Uh, everyone would be uh, aware of like tax payments. But the challenge there is we really need data uh, to help us in terms of matching, uh, which, which we've just talked about. And it's really establishing an end-to-end -end process where we can match and it's automated and not a lot of manual intervention. So that seems to be our biggest challenge. 
So we are excited about uh, ISO uh, and, and the opportunity that it offers. And, and it's good to see that with the Deloitte uh, report and analysis and, and working with Payments Canada, it's similar challenges whether you're on the government side or corporate side, it's very similar challenges in terms of uh, you know, the matching, the reconciliation, and we're hoping uh, as a, other organizations, we do have Oracle as an ERP, and, and we're hoping to work with Oracle uh, to really kind of modernize that using the enriched payments. Uh, so Alex, just to continue the theme, how do you see, or what are your thoughts on making ISO adoption successful in Canada? Okay, that's a, that's a loaded question. So <laughs> I, I would say on the government Sorry, side, and I was talking to a panelist, uh, Derek from BMO, is that governments maybe aren't in tune to like uh, pay mod modernization as much as the corporates and, uh, and banks. So it's kind of education and awareness, whether it's at the federal, provincial, or municipal level, and really understanding how to take advantage of like you know, the ISO stand, messaging standards and real-time rail. So there has to be a lot of, a lot more education in, in terms of, uh, as I mentioned, but also I see maybe someone like Payments Canada providing a coordinating role for the government side. <coughs> Again, at all levels of government, across Canada, across all the provincial jurisdictions. I think that's what we're missing. We're missing a coordinating role. Uh, we're missing kind of the education at the decision maker, maker level, so at uh, provincially or federally, that would be the deputy minister level. That they re and there's multiple deputy ministers that really need to get involved, not just on the finance side, but the government services side, treasury board, and that type of thing. So. Yeah, I mean, if I can add, like through the corporate interviews, what was very clear is, yes, they are all excited about data, right? They are interested in the ISO standard. I think the big theme that came out was, we need standardization. And we need usage guidelines to support that standardization. Uh, there is other mechanisms of data today. EDI is a good example. But I think where there have been limitations is that the standardization wasn't clear and the usage patterns weren't clear. So yes, there are corporates, some of them using EDI more successfully than others. And how they've achieved that is by achieving standardization. So I think in really making ISO successful, it's going to come down to do we have a clear standard that everyone is adopting and everyone is using, like across the board, corporates, the ERP providers, you know, and the end users alike, um, and the, you know, the central entities as well? And on top of that, do we have good usage guidelines that then industries can go and do a deeper dive on and use it to cater to their requirements within that industry? I think that became a very clear theme that it wasn't, yes, ISO you know, could be the silver bullet, could be the panacea, uh, but it really came down to can we get consistency in usage and uh, usage guidelines and standardization because I think that is going to <clears throat> determine the success of how well data is going to flow. So Aaron, when you talk about standardization, are, is it standardization required even within Canada for across platforms like the high value system and real time payments? Is it cross-border? What, what would your be sort of your, you know, when, you, when we talk about standardization of payments, mm. what does that look like? And what, and what are the needs there? From, from the Rogers standpoint, we're, we're um, largely just Canadian. So the cross-border is not uh, as big of a concern for us because it's obviously going to be um, a lower amount of volume. But um, just within Canada, it's, um, it's, I see the, the need for the, the banks to be driving the change to their customers. Uh, and their clients and, and mandating this change to, um, or else, I, I'm, like it's, try, it's hard to see the value of it unless you're on the receiving end of the payment. Um, so if I'm just the payables, it's gonna be really hard for me to see the value of having good data in the file, in the payments that I'm making, unless I'm actually on the receiving end of that as well. So, so I, I just wanted to add on in terms of data standardization. So about two years ago within the Ontario government, we started focusing on mandatory data elements. As an example, say on the vendor supplier side, we're capturing the business number, we're capture, capturing the legal name, operating as name, the address, uh, contact information. So I think organizations, whether it's government or corporates, have to really standardize their data internally first and to prepare for you know, ISO and pay mod. So we've been really focused on that uh, that's been a driver in terms of the mandatory data elements and getting prepared. Uh, 
you know, another element is going to be the, the size of the data fields. Um, sometimes the, the current data fields are not large enough to contain the, the information that we would require in order to make it useful for us. It's a perfect segue to my, my, my next question. What type of data, or data elements are necessary or valued in your organization? So you talk about not having enough uh, bandwidth there. What, what additional data would be most valuable to you? Um, I think that the customers are using and sending data today. It's just it's not in a consistent format. So I think people want to provide the information and they want to make sure their payments <clears throat> are applied to the correct uh, accounts or invoices. But um, because there's not a standard that everyone is using, it's going to be in different fields depending on how the customers have their uh, payable set up. Um, if it was in a standard format, then everybody would have one column with an invoice number. Everybody would have one column with the uh, account number that they're paying. Right now, um, if there's 10 fields, one customer could put it in the first field, one customer could put it in the last field. So for us to try, and sometimes it's not even included at all, but um, we do see that, that uh, customers are including data with their payments, but because there's not that standardized format, it's um, really messy to try and work through it. Go over to Ryan. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, just, uh, just again on the data, what are key data elements? So as I mentioned, our challenge is on uh, the receivable side. So on the outgoing payments, by capturing the uh, vendor numbers or business numbers, as I mentioned, on the incoming side, we do capture information like social insurance information, driver's license information, um, date of birth information. And there are privacy challenges with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are the types of data elements that we need wh when we do the back-end reconciliation manually. Uh, going forward from a you know, system or process, we need to capture those uh, elements and more to make it more automated. So, so Ryan and Vivek, in yeah. terms of what we heard or what you heard in when you went out and spoke to the market, is this consistent? What, you know, maybe you can add some flavor based yeah, on what you heard no, from others. Yeah, no, absolutely. I found, um, I mean, one of the things I found fascinating in the cross-country journey in, in interviewing large corporates is... Uh, I don't want to date myself, but it felt like watching an episode of MacGyver. I mean, just <laughs> yeah. the, the initiatives and the sort of, um, you know, creative solutions that were being implemented in order to, to manage reconciliation. You essentially had heroes out there cobbling together solutions with, you know, some chewing gum and, you know, an elastic band. <laughs> we spoke to, um, you know, a large uh, oil and gas company that had effectively opened up different um, bank accounts for all of their individual, um, you know, payees or payors. Uh, in order to reconcile. So they would effectively pay a bank account. They would, at the end of the day, then reconcile all of that into one master bank account. And so it was really interesting. But um, what I find is fascinating is this, this conference that we kind of launch into as Payments Canada, uh, you know, anticipating the sort of emphasis on innovation, you know, speed. Uh, it really kicked off with Sir Tim, Tim, Sir Tim Berners Lee talking about standards. And that has been just a permeating theme I have found throughout the course of this conversation. Uh, one of my favorite phrases so far is standardized standards, which feels a little redundant, but I guess it's, uh, <laughs> is, is applicable. Um, but, but absolutely, I mean, we're hearing it loud and clear because the amount of resources right now not being used efficiently in terms of back office processes to man you know, manually reconcile checks, you know, some of these creative mm -hmm. solutions. I mean, it's amazing to think if all this energy currently be expended in those endeavors could be concentrated on some forward moving, revenue generating, you know, element, then, you know, we'd be much better off as, a, you know, as an economy on the whole. So it's been fascinating to, to see. And a little bit sad, I mean, the reliance on checks is incredible, which, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, is really one step up from, you know, etching on a stone tablet. We're still there <laughs> in the 21st century. So, um, you know, through modernization, obviously, we hope to eliminate a lot of that friction, you know, to Alex's sort of anecdote to kick things off and make things easier for, you know, players in the Canadian payments ecosystem. I, I just wanted to follow up in terms of checks. So, You've heard the war on talent, right? There's a war on checks in the Ontario government, okay? As in trying to get rid of them because they're so costly and efficient and not really a good solution for, you know, Ontario <coughs> citizens. Uh, on the benefits side, we are trying to be innovative. An example I could use is the reloadable uh, uh, benefit payment card. It's very common in the U.S. The city of Toronto introduced it, I think, in Ontario or Canada initially. The Ontario government jumped on that. that. That's decreased our utilization of checks to uh, recipients or beneficiaries significantly. It's even increased uh, direct deposit and EFTs. So that, that's a good story. So we are trying to get rid of checks. Uh, it's just not a great payment mechanism. Yeah, I think 
when you look at the corporate environment, you know, like uh, Alex said, there is there is a war on checks, mm. and I think corporates. We were, we were amazed to see how much corporates have innovated around what is available. Uh, so they are using, uh, you know, chewing gum and a hodgepodge <laughs> of solutions to just manage this data with, you know, with the payment or data without the payment, uh, and have architected various solutions to achieve that, uh, getting the data together. And it's really important because when we ask them questions about, you know, what kind of benefits do you think it drives? Many of them have armies of people ranging from 50 to 350 to 400 people purely working on reconciliation uh, because they receive a massive number of payments. The government, you know, is no stranger to the amount of payments they receive or send. And I think that that efficiency benefit is uh, is a very is quite understated. And I think we need to start to talk a bit more about that, and because that is going to drive productivity, and you can then get the corporates focusing on you know what they do really well. Uh, but I think the key really is making sure the data comes with the payment, because then you can use the solutions today that then start to do better reconciliation. So Ryan, when we talk about standardizing standards, <laughs> and the information and the, the feedback you receive from from the research, how does that work into the modernization and the journey and the work that Payments Canada is undertaking? Yeah, so, I mean, Alex had talked a little bit about, you know, Payments Canada playing a role as far as education is concerned, and obviously we're looking to plug uh, the players in the Canadian payments ecosystem into resources that can help drive awareness around the ISO standard and the benefits that it can provide. Um, you know, further to the theme of standardized standards, we are obviously looking at industry-specific standards to make sure that the, the language is common and that obviously the, the benefits of standards are realized. Um, some interesting feedback we've received as well is around, you know, unstructured. Um, remittance data as well because obviously try as you may to sort of capture all the various needs within the payments ecosystem there may be sort of niche applications for information that's transmitted and so work definitely continues and again exercises such as this one and Canada Payments continues to or Payments Canada sorry continues to engage players in the Canadian payments ecosystem in order to continue to get that feedback and ensure that we're basically hearing those voices and making sure that when modernization comes we've delivered something that meets those needs. And is there standardization of ISO across the platforms? Under, underway? Under uh, well, I mean, work, value and work continues on that front. So essentially, um, with the modernization platforms that will be delivered, the first one delivered will have the ISO 20022 standard, and then other platforms will have that enablement as we go forward. Any other comments on data at this point? <coughs> I think we can keep talking about data. <laughs> data. <laughs> we probably can, and we've probably heard it a lot. Yeah. Okay, so let me jump to the, to the really the, the second highest need that we heard uh, in, the, in the research, and that was uh, transparency, and maybe what I can ask uh, Vivek, uh, since the late you, you conducted the research, maybe I can give you, uh, ask you to just provi provide a definition when, when you were out speaking to corporates and government, what transparency actually means. Yeah, so when we define transparency, we defined it with kind of two lenses. I think lens one is transparency that your beneficiary has received that payment. So it's a bit of a, it's confirmation of receipt or confirmation of funds availability. The other part of transparency is really about do you know where the payment is in that life in in its mm -hmm. life cycle, you know is it uh, is it almost there is it getting there is it a two day is it a three day, you know we had corporates tell us about transparency and they're like we kind of we're in an Amazon world where we know where our package is but somehow on payments we don't know where that is, um, and so you know it's kind of two parts confirmation and then knowing where the payment is in its life cycle I think those were the two things that we <coughs> anchored on in trying to understand where the benefit is. When you get into things like real-time um, real payments or instant payments, this notion of knowing where the payment is is a little, is, is, is kind of a, a, a duplicate because you're going to get it instantaneously, you're going to get the confirmation and you're going to know that the payment has reached. But when you start to look at other payment types, um, you know, the batch, the large value, uh, the cross-border, I think that's where the traceability or knowing where the payment is in its chain is actually more important. Because that today starts to drive a whole number of calls and servicing requests that corporates, governments are all uh, taking on to serve their customers. I think when you understand where it is in the cycle, you can start to see benefits from there. So Alex, if I were to ask you to speak for uh, terms of Ontario payments, how does transparency, uh, what are the pain points around transparency for, transparency for you and how do you see uh, greater transparency or what do you see about greater <coughs> transparency that would improve your uh, processes and operations? So I, I think there's a significant uh, issue in, in terms of government payments going out. So although we do a good job of getting the payments out, it, it's really for the uh, beneficiary understanding what those payments are for. As I mentioned, you could have multiple <coughs> government uh, payments. It could be f the single 
a person or family could receive a social housing benefit, a dental benefit, a drug benefit, but they, they get those payments and they don't understand what they're for. So that's key for transparency, is receiving those payments and understanding which program it's for. And that's where the enriched data and more data would be helpful. Uh, so, you know, that's what we're excited about in, in terms of data transparency on the outgoing <coughs> payments of this, especially. Aaron, maybe I can ask you the same question. Sure. Um, it's, I just, I've been chuckling to myself. It's like, when I think of transparency, I think of the, the phrase, oh, the check's in the mail. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, for us, that's, that's, that's what it is. Because like, the only real-time payment that we have today is, is credit card. And um, for my role, credit card fees are a challenge. And if we're always um, looking at minimizing our costs to process payments, we want to see other options out there. Um, when the customer makes an online banking payment, yes, it's quick and it's, and it's cheap for us to process, um, but there's no way that we know that that payment is on its way. So if we're on the phone with a customer saying, if you don't make a payment today, your services might be uh, put on hold, their only real option to get the payment to us immediately is gonna be a credit card payment. Um, and uh, for a collection tool, it's great because they get it immediately, they can confirm, yes, it's been processed, okay, we'll make sure that your, your lines are not canceled. But from a payment processing side, it's uh, the cost of processing that payment too is a, is a big concern for us. On a credit card, you, do you run the challenge though that it may be authorized, but you still run the issue of charge backs in the background? Yep. Right? Yeah, and we have to manage chargebacks and, and fraud on, on the back end of it as well. And it's, uh, that creates another challenge where, again, it's not guaranteed funds. And Vivek talked about real-time payments, you know, maybe perhaps solving some of the issues with transparency just because of the speed. Do you see that being a, a solution? Or, I mean, Vivek also talked about real-time payments with receipt notification. Is it the receipt notification that really is an important piece of the real-time payment or both? Um, it would be both. Like, um, I was just in a panel just before this one, and uh, it, was a, it was a game changer. Um, that was the term that we used for it. Um, because it, it's, it's such a big opportunity to look at all of our processing, and not just the payment processing. It's also our billing, like, uh, and our collection process. If we have a different uh, avenue for collecting payments where we can get real-time payments that are not credit card, we have to say, okay, well, that's going to be a huge benefit for us. So how can we take that on? Um, so just the opportunities um, with real-time payments, it just it, really excited about big data and uh, real-time payments. Does it help you on the buyer side? Um, not as much. Um, on that side, we want to hold on to the money for as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it right? here. <laughs> um, we, we heard that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a less shocking outcome of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I just wanted to add to that, so definitely the rich data is number one for governments, uh, but the real-time payments presents a great opportunity. And the, the, But again, in terms of uh, opportunity comes risk. Uh, you know, are, are, we, are we sending the real-time payments uh, uh, to the right beneficiary? So, and, and what do we have to do in terms of mm -hmm. fraud prevention and, and looking at uh, maybe introducing AI or some kind of monitoring tracking. Uh, so, and, and we, so whether it's the data or the transparency, you know, from a government perspective, it, it's about efficiency, cost, savings, and the, you know, client or citizen experience. So that's what's driving us. Uh, we're kind of digital full first. We're trying to be. Uh, you know, better, faster, simpler is kind of the current government tagline. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the real-time payments helps us to be faster, but uh, how about the fraud and, and that type of thing, so. Yeah, I agree, like um, the advances in e-transfers, um, like the bank, some of the banks now are able to do batch processing by uh, e-transfers, and that's great, but it's, um, again, the security around it. How do we know that uh, the correct person is receiving those funds? So that was, a, that was another theme. It's kind of an undertone in many of these, which is we want to know who the beneficiary is, especially in cases where the businesses are not in a face-to-face -face interaction with their customer and they are receiving it through other mechanisms. Uh, there was a need to understand that, yeah, this is Vivek. I am sending it to him, right? Or it is Ryan. I'm sure that this is where the payment is being sent to. 
Uh, and you know that's where these concepts all start to come together, right? You need transparency, you need confirmation of receipt, you need to know it is the right beneficiary, and they start to kind of play together. Uh, we found that when there were corporates who were not in that face-to-face -face interaction, like it was a big concern for them. And again, you know, they are using various solutions, sending micro payments, sending ten dollars, fifty dollars as a means to confirm before they can release the larger payments. Um, we heard that pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I remember. Alex kind of kicked us off with anecdotes, so maybe I'll use one now. I remember sitting in one of the interviews with, um, with a large transportation company, and they were essentially talking about how transparency would enable them to essentially release a train. So it's not just the goods related to that company that's making the payment, but there's actually this downstream impact of all these other companies that are relying on, on the transportation. And so we spent about half an hour talking about how transparency would allow that to happen and that would enable that. And I sat there and I kind of, you know when you have a question you don't want to ask it because you think it's a dumb question? So I had one of those. It's not, not an infrequent occurrence, but in this case it <laughs> happened. Um, and at the end of it, I just said, well, what's more transparent than having money in the bank versus real time? Um, but I think what I didn't take into consideration there, it's, it's also the, the sender of yeah. the payment that wants that transparency. And so one of the things that we have the benefit of doing, you know, in Canada, clearly we've, we've lagged a little bit in terms of, you know, uh, innovation in the payment space, but we can see what's taken place in regimes that are preceding us on this journey. So in the UK, essentially, uh, both the sending bank and the receiving bank will receive notification. Uh, in the United States, the um, sending bank receives notification, same as Australia. So we can look at that, and obviously that provides an opportunity to, uh, you know, for a bank, quite frankly, just basically pass down that value onto their customers as well. Um, and, and essentially, in some cases, maybe provide a competitive advantage, but obviously it's a value add that a bank can provide to their customers and ultimately benefit from customer satisfaction through, through that type of interaction. So, and Vivek, so Ryan touched on sort of global uh, solutions. What mm -hmm. did you find in the global scan uh, related to transparency that would be useful as we modernize in Canada? Yeah, so I think it's uh, like that theme is pretty consistent in terms of when you look at Australia or UK or even the US for that matter, you know, the focus is on transparency, data. Like these themes are not net new. But I think when they've architected these solutions, they are providing this capability such as notifications, right? So notifications to the participating banks on either sides allows them to serve their customers uh, in that fashion, right? Exactly the point that Ryan said. So, you know, UK is a good example there. Australia is a great example there. And I think you're starting to see these, these facilities being made available that can then serve up to those corporates who can, you know, who then know, okay, you know, I got the money, I got the notification, it's in the bank. And... You know, now I'm prepared to release a, release a shipment or I'm prepared to release goods. Um, we also spoke to one, um, uh, another government entity. They deal in a lot of the regulated goods um, like liquor, cannabis, et cetera. And they, f they were very particular that they wanted a combination of both transparency and guaranteed funds, right? Because that was the certainty that they needed to release that particular regulated good. So you start to see... Uh, this ability to do notifications, this ability to have the right information, this ability to see the transaction through is really critical, right? And it allows for the freer movement of goods and services, which otherwise start to get locked up in, in different parts of that value chain. So, uh, Sorry, I was just going to add, I, I think from a government perspective, we've learned a lot from the engagement with Deloitte and Payments Canada, definitely looking at what Australia, New Zealand, UK are doing. Mm. And so we have a lot to learn, definitely from a government perspective. So that's valuable information so that when we're doing our planning, our internal planning on what we want to focus on, the, the next payments uh, mechanism, we do take a look at that information. So it's very valuable. So I know when we commissioned the study, the intent originally was looking and more of a focus on real-time payments. Although we did morph, I think we wanted to, to dive a little deeper just on corporate payment needs in general. Uh, Ryan, when we talk about traceability and transparency, how does that feedback play into some of the work that you're doing uh, on some of the other aspects beyond the real-time rail, so links, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, I think just, just to sort of go back on real-time, I think that um, I, I wouldn't say that shock reverberated through the halls of Payments Canada when it came back to transparency was maybe more you know, important than speed. I think we have to take into consideration we were talking primarily to large corporations. And so um, you know, when you're talking about scenarios where um, you know, cash flow is maybe not as primary of a concern, where you have reserve, where you can weather 24 hours, 48 hours, who knows, then you know, ultimately it doesn't seem that surprising. We do anticipate as we speak to um, you know, some of the more small, medium-sized enterprises that it may come forth a little bit more in terms of the, the, the benefits of speed. Um, I know that in situations where you had, um, we, we spoke obviously some use cases we got out of the insurance industry 
uh, we talk about disaster relief efforts. And so Fort McMurray was one that came up frequently where houses burned down, bank branches burned down, you fled your home with your cell phone and that's it. You know, so how do we, how do we enable getting you know, benefit payments to those individuals in sort of an expedient fashion? And so um, you know, certainly transparency came across loud and clear, but by no means does it mean that we've sort of you know, pulled back from understanding the importance of real time. We recognize our likely use cases where real time will, will obviously have a lot of relevance. relevance sorry. And uh, sorry, I just wanted to follow up on that. So that's an excellent example of, in terms of Fort McMurray. In Ontario, we fight forest fires every year. So getting payments uh, we, we, to them is really critical. We also have remote areas that, that we have to figure out how to get payments to. So it's trying to problem solve those. Uh, and, and sometimes just the check doesn't work, right? Maybe, and there's also a population that's unbanked. So they don't have bank accounts. So what do you do? So there's kind of that ongoing challenge. So a good segue talking about going back to real time payments. Um, and Ryan, you mentioned some of the use cases you heard. Um, perhaps we can start with Aaron in terms of what are the use cases that you would see for real time payments that would be beneficial? Um, again, uh, probably the biggest impact is going to be the cost. What's the cost to making changes to accommodate this new payment method? Um, if the costs are reasonable, then it could be a full end-to-end -end solution from starting at our billing to our collections to um, receiving the actual payments to refunds to customers. Um, if the opportunity and technology is there and there's the business case proves that it's, a, it's the way to, for us to go, then it's, it's going to be a, a huge undertaking. But um, I think the, there's plenty of benefits that we can reap out of that. And I know we, we have on the screen for everybody sort of the, 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 uh, what we heard, again, from the study in terms of the, really the areas of, of most importance, and we sort of put them in, in the in sequence. Um, what you see on screen, are they consistent with where you see you know, the value? So data being number one, um, transparency being number two, or do you see some of these other attributes that we have uh, from your organization being more important, like uh, instant payment delivery as an example, which we found to be you know, lower down on the list of corporate needs. Yeah, it, it would be lower on the needs. And like for, for myself, it's the, it's the rich data and the real-time payments. Um, but the, the big part about both of those is how much it's going to cost. If right now my in-house solutions are solving 60% of my problems, but to implement uh, real-time payments, it's going to cost me $5 million, then it's... Um, it's going to have to be a pretty hefty business case to justify the, the reason for making the change in that, right? A lot, of, uh, a lot of companies that have been around for a while have a lot of legacy systems, and we have uh, more than one of them. Um, so it's, it's trying to figure out how we get our um, older systems to accommodate this new payment flow. Is that your challenge as well, uh, Alex? I know you mentioned Oracle. You're an Oracle shop. Uh, is that sort of one of the big barriers for you to adopt uh, real-time payments, perhaps, or are I, there other things? I would say the government has many barriers. <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple of things. Uh, I agree that cost is a huge uh, driver. Uh, so with budget cuts, uh, you know, that's fairly critical. I think that presents a great opportunity for the fintech techs and pay techs out there uh, if they can figure out the government procurement rules. Uh, you know, it's a great opportunity, but I w what I see, and, and I was at an earlier session where it was the federal government uh, partnered with a fintech, uh, partnered with a bank for solution, uh, and the solution presented to the federal government was a no-cost option. Great opportunity. So something I learned uh, is that with the partnership, uh, you can make something happen. So even if there is no money available or or cost as an issue or driver, it, you, you can make something happening, happen by being creative, innovative, and partnership. So, and I think, uh, you know, that's kind of the theme I see within the Ontario government is partnership, like we have multiple partnerships, whether it's with Oracle or the big banks or, or different uh, vendors. It's like, what was the biggest hurdle we heard from the corporates and government uh, when, you went out, when you went out and did your research? Was there one or two that were really the big barriers? I think um, <clears throat> Aaron and both Alex have kind of hit the main point, which is 
you know, it is, they, they will be on a cycle of adoption and you're going to have to uh, help and support them in, in building out what's that business case. It's going to be driven on the back of efficiency. It's going to be driven on the back of uh, simplifying some of these uh, business process flows and workflows to actually make it easier, right? And so you're going to build it on the back of that. Uh, I think when you think about their applications, you know, we were talking to many corporates, governments, and, you know, we said, oh, how will you adopt? And they said, well, if you think you've got legacy, we've got legacy too. <laughs> um, and so I think that theme, we, were, we, we said, okay, that's interesting. And so for them, it was all about if we can hit the cycle of upgrade that they are getting into, or if you can drive a business case that helps them understand that, you know, this adoption is actually going to drive a lot of efficiency. Um, I think that will start to make it easier. Um, you know, this point about partnership and collaboration, I think we've heard that theme recurring throughout the conference. I think that's another emerging piece, right? So how do you bring together the varied stakeholders together at the same time to kind of think about this problem together uh, and then use infrastructures that are available, right? So through Payments Canada's modernization program, they're looking at putting uh, changes to the payments infrastructure. So how do you take that? How do you take the complements? How do you take the providers and come together to really find solutions that can then help you know, corporates, end users, small businesses alike, right, to really start to get value out of what we've done. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about some of the, um, you know, enhanced efficiencies within an organization that could be delivered, but some of the thing that we touched upon but didn't come up, but, um, you know, the potential for data analytics, you know, through enhanced data. So the opportunity to identify and essentially create new revenue streams uh, instead of just basically streamlining, you know, internal processes inside. So. You know, we do talk about, um, you know, creating an environment where there is access for that innovation to take place, as Alex had mentioned, and the partnership, you know, that Vivek had talked about. These are all essential things because they're more creative minds than, than mine, obviously, out there that could sort of, you know, come up with solutions to, to help to strengthen that business case around what the benefits of, um, of modernizing systems are. I mean, in terms of that innovation, I think about, uh, and it's not the most sophisticated payments example by any stretch of the imagination, but if you think about TAP, you know, to pay, that's not something I ever would have asked for, ever. Um, but I'm terribly inconvenienced now when I have to enter four digits into a <laughs> pin pad, and then I got to go running for some hand sanitizer after the fact. And so, um, you know, that's an innovation in the payment space, and again, not very sophisticated. But I didn't ask for it. Someone thought of it. You know what? I'm glad they did because I don't like the alternative anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I I just wanted to add. So the the little money that the government does have, uh, we are looking at uh, AI and uh, something called robotics process automation. So we are spending, uh, trying to be uh, targeted, uh, and, and we're looking at uh, those types of options for the government. And again, it's reducing uh, costs, improving efficiency, and, and that type of thing. So I, I think that's a, a future uh, in payments in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, AI, et cetera. I definitely agree. We've been using RPA probably for about eight months to a year now, okay. and it's helping um, automate a lot of the manual processing that we had. Yeah, I, I think you're going to <clears throat> see some interesting use cases and innovations come about because of a good platform. Uh, it was one of the companies yesterday talking about, you know, I just need the ability to move money of any denomination instantly, right, to a certain entity. And if you give me that foundation, then I can drive use cases that can then be beneficial. Right, so it's really important that we have the right foundation that allows the innovators to play in that space. And then, you know, you start to see partnerships and other ways to make things easier uh, for corporate. So I think that's kind of like really important to make sure that we, you know, we, we, we think through uh, because that will create the foundation, right? And then you can start to see how different companies are just going to use that facility. Uh, Ryan, in terms of, were, were there any surprises out of the research, uh, particularly as it relates to real-time payments? <coughs> Uh, you know, I think certainly from my perspective, I was surprised to see that you know speed yeah. wasn't necessarily uh, high on the list. Were there uh, were there surprises for you uh, based on the research? I think I think that was the key one. How how far down the list of priorities speed ended up coming? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I alluded to it earlier. I think the transparency in many ways stands in for speed for a large corporation that you know can sort of withstand you know forty eight hours you know delay in the payment. Um, you know, that was, that was probably the biggest surprise for me. And I'm trying to think about, uh, about any other surprises. But, um, but ultimately, you know, I, I sort of put forth a theory in terms of, and it's not a theory held by myself, but in terms of, you know, as we sort of look at different segments within the stakeholder ecosystem, consumers, small, medium-sized enterprises that will see that speed come to the forefront, 
But it's important to us at Payments Canada not just to have those assumptions, but to test those assumptions to basically go out, capture the voice of the stakeholder. Because if we're reflecting what we're hearing and we're demonstrating that we've heard it, then it strengthens the value proposition of the platforms for modernization and frankly legitimizes our efforts because we're not just sitting in a hermetically sealed box theorizing. We're actually gathering the needs of Canadians and ensuring that we're, we're delivering upon those needs in the end. So I think speed was really the, the biggest surprise. I mean, no question. Yeah, and for us, like speed, if we have transparency, then we don't necessarily need the speed. If we know a payment's going to be coming um, and we have it being tracked on our way to us, then we know it's going to get there. When it gets there, it's not as big of a concern for us. Okay. Let me put you two on the spot. Uh, modernization and the components of modernization. You all both have strategic plans, I assume. Modernization on that three to five year plan already? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like it, it's, it's always there and I'm really excited about uh, getting enriched data and having the opportunity to have real-time payments. Um, but again, the big, the big thing is the business case that we have to build to justify the cost in um, adjusting our systems to be able to accommodate it. And the business case and, and just trying to figure out um, if it makes sense. And are we going to be an early adopter or are we going to see how everybody else uh, succeeds or fails using the new technology or um, where we fit in that? Alex, yes, no. Um, j just a quick answer. So. Uh, <laughs> For us, uh, we do have uh, a strategic plan in terms of modernization, but better education in, in terms of what uh, Payments Canada is doing. Uh, and uh, reports like the Deloitte report will help us a lot in terms of education and awareness. The other thing, too, is that governments announce programs or new programs. You may have heard of the autism file that was announced. So whether it's the autism file or any other program, we have to figure out how to deliver that from a payments perspective. So when that's announced, and, and that's fairly, uh, you know, it, it's a opportunity uh, or like a, a government change uh, in direction, but we have to react to it as civil servants. Like how do we get the payments out there? So when a new program is announced, how do we get the payments out there? So sometimes that's not in the strategic plan, but we have to figure out the modernization aspect on how to deliver that, the foundation. So. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, I, we have a, some time. I want to open it up to questions to those in the room. Um, perhaps you can just put your hand up. I don't think we have a mic, so if you can just uh, yell, that would be great. Let's we'll start at the there. back. in Canada uh, to evolve, uh, to adjust both worlds, and do you have any suggestions of how corporates and banks can navigate between the two areas? We'd like to take that one. Oh, playing hot potato on this one. I <laughs> um, no, I think it's, you know, the, the scenario you've described, uh, I think pretty well captures some of the healthy tension we have in our system right now, obviously, um, and dealing with stakeholders, obviously, you know, when, I, when I'm speaking to fintech, small, medium-sized enterprises, like modernization, bring it tomorrow. But obviously, you know, to your point, there are other considerations that need to be taken. So we do have to be thoughtful and deliberate about it um, and ensure that we do, you know, guarantee the safety and security of Canadians. So there's, there's always that sort of delicate balance that needs to take place. You know, from a regulatory perspective, obviously we are, you know, um, constantly engaged with regulators to, to determine whether or not what the direction may be on that. Um, I will say right now we're in an election year, so generally the feedback that we're receiving is that things do tend to sort of you know, take a pause uh, as far as that concerned. But we have basically received some pretty encouraging signals in the recent past as part of the budget um, that lead us to believe that at some point down the road, um, there will be a stance taken. Now, the general consensus is, and I know there was a, a forum on open banking that took place yesterday, that it may be sort of a soft regulation. Again, um, I can't say definitively. It's really not my call to be, to be honest with you, but that's kind of the direction that we see things going in. So I just wanted to add that uh, from a government perspective, privacy is a big deal. Security of data is a big deal. It's on everyone's checklist. We're not implementing anything uh, until we look at the privacy perspective. We have privacy experts that we have to go to. And in fact, if there's a privacy breach, we have to go through a protocol, uh, including going through the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. So it's a big deal. So the, the government overemphasizes you know, the security uh, of data for its citizens. So 
uh, that's really critical, and especially in the payments, whether it's outgoing or incoming payments. So privacy is a big deal. And I think if I can speak on behalf of the banking spec, uh, sector, and we heard yesterday, and I think it's, it's paramount to everything banks do, it comes down to trust at the end of the day. Um, banks invest significantly to ensure the safety of, uh, of the data that they collect, uh, and that's something that you know, as we move through transformation will continue to, uh, it's, it's a continued theme for sure. Uh, I think I see a microphone there. Um, I'm an Aussie that's recently just moved here. Um, it's really interesting to hear the same sort of challenges. I've worked in Australia uh, and in Singapore. They're now implementing the Pebble network uh, to be able to do e-invoicing with the view of being able to attach payments to that. Understanding all the issues that you've just spoken about, is that something the Canadian government's looking at and then potentially opening that up to SMBs or anything like that? I think, uh, like, if I, if I think about the evolution, right, you're going to have a foundation. Once you have the foundation and you have enough facilities and flexibility in that foundation for data, then you can start to do things like invoicing and, you know, it's part of that evolution. Um, you know, you look at Australia, they've started with the basic P2P platform and then future overlays are going to get into that invoicing world, right? It's the pay with PDF, do the bill payments and all of those things. You look at more advanced markets like uh, Finland, they're already well on that e-invoicing path, right? Because they have that platform and they have the foundation, and so you can then build upon that foundation. So I think it's on the horizon. It doesn't look near right now because we are you know, very much into the, uh, into the details of modernization and what we need to put out there and what we need to execute on. But I think uh, the next evolution of that is definitely things like e-invoicing, you know, things that are going to make some of these frictions go away in the, in the current ecosystem. Anyone else? Oh, perhaps maybe pass it forward. Great. Peter? Hi. Um, the question, probably mainly for Rogers and to some extent the government, but um, you mentioned that, uh, first of all, for you as well as for everybody, cost of making all the systems changes is, is a huge barrier and that uh, the bulk of the benefits for data are on the receiving side, but um, you don't get the data on the receiving side unless somebody puts it there, which is making changes on the paying side where you said that the benefits are less. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could comment on, uh, do you have willingness to kind of pay it forward and make changes on the payment side uh, to benefit some other receiver? Or do you have any thoughts about how we kind of get around that paradox that uh, the receiver benefits but the payor makes the changes? Yeah, like it's, it, it could be a never ending circle, right? It's, um, but um, if we're driving adoption on the receiving side, then I would definitely uh, drive it on the, the payment side. and. Um, and I would definitely want everybody to do that, obviously, on the receiving side. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be cost on, on the payable side. And where, are they going to see a benefit from it? There's not really anything there. Right? But in companies where you're, you're sending and receiving money, hopefully the two sides can get together and say, listen, it's going to cost you X, but it's going to save me Y. Um, and hopefully that would balance out. Uh, just from the government perspective, the focus has always been on uh, payments going out and benefits to citizens, the majority of cost, expenditures, etc. Uh, that's shifting to incoming payments, uh, uh, and, and we are looking at both sides. You know, is there some opportunity that can help both sides? Uh, and we focused on, as I mentioned earlier, the mandatory data elements on either side makes sense, but uh, we are trying to spend more money on on the receiving side. So I know uh, we started a little late. I think we have time for one more call co or question because I want to get you out on time. Uh, but what I will say is maybe we can all stick around for a few minutes after. So if you don't get your question uh, posed to the panel, we can certainly uh, talk to you afterwards. So You might get two in because this is short. Um, <laughs> just thinking about surprising news that uh, faster payments are not uh, really driving the adoption of some of this new technology. Do you think in a different interest rate environment that answer would be different? You know. So we we we, we tested that right. So um, I think speed, like from a corporate perspective, on the you know coming back to Aaron's point, on the receivable side, they're like, yeah, speed would be great. On the sending side, we want to hold it as long as possible. Uh, but also there are existing processes that are just managing all of this, right? So to make that shift you're going to have to see more benefits than just a better rate on your, um, you know, on, on what you're holding mm -hmm. right now. Um, and I think so it's a combination of having existing processes that kind of work very well today, 
Uh, and it's also a combination of saying that, well, um, I am prepared to hold it as long as I need to, and I don't really see the benefits of the speed because I'm not really going to get a net benefit out of it, given the cost of implementation and things like that. So I think that's kind of the trade-off that came with speed. Uh, perfectly happy to get things with more speed all the time, especially when you look at the uh, C2B type interactions, you know, cases like Rogers as an example. Um, you know, they, they obviously were highly interested that their customers could pay their bills immediately, instantaneously, so that, you know, they wouldn't have to cut off the services and things like that. But it is a, it is a good question. It does remind me some of the feedback we received. There was a relatively large corporation, well, like all of them were, uh, that did talk about some of the benefits of being able to send at the very last minute because they do hold their, you know, cash in various savings vehicles that would enable them to earn interest. And so that would obviously be a potential benefit to some, some mm -hmm. companies. All right, I think we're at time. I just wanted to mention to folks in the room, uh, we do have in the room uh, a report of the Deloitte research. Uh, if you're afraid that it, this glossy may put you overweight in your luggage, uh, the information will also be available online about the end of the month, I think, yep. in both languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly you'll see the, uh, this information posted for everyone to see. Uh, I want to thank our panelists today. A uh, great session, particularly after last night's party and the Raptors' disappointment. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.